we went over some of this stuff in the introduction, so I'll glaze over it as much as possible. Um, I just want to drive home a few points, especially for NCMA test takers. This, uh, this side view here, this is something that you're going to see over and over and over again when, it, when we get to engineering, right? Because we're always talking about what keeps these walls vertical. Well, it's not necessarily always just the weight of the block. A lot of times it's the geo grid or the uh, compaction and engineering that happens behind the wall. So if you look at this side view, we've got our block, right? This is our geo grid cutting back into that angle of phi or into that shear plane. We've got the grid links long enough to get back into what we would call stable or sustainable soil, sustainable slope. A lot of different terms for that again. This looks a lot like what CJ just showed you. We've got similar installation techniques between Versalock and Rosetta. Uh, <clears throat> you know, one of the differences here is that we do recommend having a little bit of virgin soil packed in behind that base block, and that's what you're gonna set your drain pipe on. We don't want this drain pipe to be funneling water down into our base, and that's why we create that separation. We'll use virgin soil, pack it in real nice and tight, and then that's gonna create what we would consider a pretty impermeable uh, barrier between your drain rock, your drain tile, and your base. You don't want those, those things to hold hands. You want them to be separated a little bit. So make sure you're creating a little bit of separation there below that drain tile. Make sure you keep your drain tile pitched so it's gonna run water. You have to have a little bit of slope on that sucker. And that's why sometimes what I'll do on a long wall is I'll actually start out in the middle and I'll set my vent one block row higher, the center vents one block row higher. And that'll give me six inches of play or drain room on either side to kind of taper down. That way you make sure that you don't get standing stagnant water in there. The drain pipe should never be shooting water out. It's a safety valve. It's not meant to be a, a sewer pipe, it's a safety valve. So think about it that way. So we've got our grid, we've got our drain tile, six inch compacted gravel base. Again, I've seen guys pour uh, light PSI concrete. A lot of guys now, how many guys are using open graded base for their retaining walls? I see a few hands going up. I'm a huge advocate of using open graded base. It's a little bit trickier to get the blocks perfectly level, but if you screen your material back, and then if you use the same technology that we look at when we're talking about permeable pavers, where you might even screed off a three eighths inch trap chip or something on top of your three quarter clear base. That's gonna give you that nice smooth surface that you can set a block on and, <clears throat> and not have to beat the snot out of them to get them level. So open graded base is a great option with Versalock. I'd use it on every shoreline application. Whenever I use open graded base, I'm gonna add a little layer of fabric in there just to keep my base pure. I wanna make sure that my clear rock is not mixing in with my dirt and my clay and all that shit because at some point, you're gonna lose structural integrity with your base if you fill those voids in with fines. So if you get a lot of clay, you get a lot of you know, silt washing into your stone base, it's, it is gonna compromise the structural integrity. So, so make sure that you're kind of keeping that in mind when you're setting these things up. First and foremost, make tons of money and then safety second, no, safety first. Make sure you're wearing hard hats, you know, high-vis stuff, that's only something that I've run into on jobs where you're, you know, doing commercial stuff, uh, <clears throat> large general contractor, stuff like that. I don't make my guys wear hard hats and high-vis when I'm working in somebody's backyard, but make sure that you're using the proper safety equipment. You know, steel toe boots, huge safety glasses, you only get one pair of eyes. Um, Make sure that you're at least thinking about that stuff. If you're an owner, make sure that you're providing the right safety equipment for your people. Because if somebody gets hurt and you don't have that, your insurance company is going to drop you after it pays your, your claim. So just make sure that you're thinking about safety. <clears throat> One thing for NCMA test takers, uh, hit the wrong button there, let's go back. This is important. Uh, what does this mean when it says step or bench cuts preferred? Like on a tall wall, instead of just going in and digging out behind it and leaving a 10-foot vertical dirt cliff that could collapse on somebody or if somebody was standing up on the upper side, they'd slide down and, and you know, do bench cuts. So maybe cut out three, four feet at a time. That way you don't have one massive drop, you've broken that up. It's just a, a safety precaution as you're excavating out for these walls. 
Always be thinking about what your wall's holding up, you know, whether it be a building, um, parking lot. I've had jobs where I've had to go in and cut out a hillside. Think about that 50 foot oak tree that you're compromising uh, by, by digging out the base of, right? Oaks have nice deep roots, maybe that's not a great example, but like a pine tree or something like that, you dig too close to that and you're gonna undermine the root system and that tree's gonna fall on somebody. So think about what you're cutting into and what the soil that you're removing is holding up. What is up will come down if you destabilize it. So just you know, bear that in mind, you don't want anything falling on top of you. Proper tools, proper gear. Again, the Versalock lifter is a huge safety improvement over uh, trying to do those controlled drops like we talked about. Fall protection for all walls. Make sure you're putting those red fences up or or orange fences up. Make sure you're your guys safe and, and you know, maybe even more so important, make sure that the neighbor's $8,000, you know, Shih Tzu puppy or whatever doesn't fall off in there and get hurt or somebody's kid or whatever it is. Make sure if you've got a large drop, you're, you're taking some sort of precaution, caution tape or a fence. This is the most important part of any retaining walls, the base course. Um, this is where you're gonna spend the majority of your time. So when I'm bidding retaining walls, and you know, I, I know there's a lot of owners here too, but when I'm bidding retaining walls, I bid <coughs> my first my, my vertical base, I bid that separate than I do the rest of the square footage of my wall because I'm gonna be able, once I get my base in, I'm gonna be able to stack multiple square feet in just a few minutes, right? I know that's gonna be super efficient. I know how long that's gonna take. When you talk about base, this is something that is uh, directly related to you know a couple things, site conditions, but also the skill of the guy that's doing it. Like if you got a guy that's been set in retaining wall base for five, 10 years and he's, laser precise and he's a ninja, you're gonna be able to set base pretty quick. But if you got a guy that you're just teaching and uh, maybe struggles a little bit with details, you know, again, the guy that's stealing all your pencils and can never find a tape measure, you know, maybe don't have that guy setting your retaining wall base up. You know, when, it, when I was real small and I just had one crew, I always wanted to set the base. I wanted my hands on every single base block because then I would know it was perfect, it was level. Uh, <clears throat> does anybody do anything besides setting the block level front to back. You obviously want these blocks to be completely level side to side, but when you start talking front to back, is that true? You want it to be completely level? I see a couple of heads shaking. No, I always set them with a little bit of cutback, right? So that means that the front lip of the block, I might have just an eighth of a bubble higher. And what that's gonna do is make sure that if I do have uh, today we'll make fun of Joe because we got a we got a bunch of Joes here today. So you know, if you got a guy that uh, a Joe that's not super proficient at setting retaining wall block, you know that he's not going to have that block tipping forward because that's where you start to really interfere with the engineering specifications of the block. Whenever you reduce a block's batter, you're reducing its ability to withstand the force behind it because it wants to tip forward. So I always set these walls, just tipping back just a little bit into that hillside. As long as you keep it consistent, nobody will ever know except for you, but it will help keep your wall vertical. So there's lots of ways to do this. This guy's using a laser transit. Uh, how many of you guys are using zip levels? You got zip line levels now? You can use a zip line level, you can use a laser transit. When I'm doing long walls, I prefer a laser transit. Uh, when I'm doing short walls, I like old school. I'll use like a six or an eight foot Stanley level, you know, it's uh, whatever's gonna keep you efficient and moving along quickly, but, but keep your uh, base perfectly level. What these guys are doing <clears throat> is they're actually using this laser transit to set up screed rails, right? So these pipes, if I'm setting this wall up, this pipe right here is gonna be level side to side, but it's gonna probably be maybe a 16th of an inch higher than this uh, rail back here. So as I screen this off, I'm setting myself up for success to have that wall cutting back into the hillside a little bit more instead of wanting to tip forward. This is a great way to set retaining wall base if you got a long wall. You can see this guy's got step ups here. So he's stepping up from the bottom. He might have three or four of them. It makes it easy to do that because you've got predetermined heights on your rails. So it does make it a lot easier if you have step ups and long walls to set up these screed rails. 
then you have to over excavate. So it's one of those things, trade off. That's why every single job is unique. You always want to think through all these little options. But, but that's how these guys are doing it. Really efficient way to set it up. They're going to fill that thing up. They're going to come through, screen it off. And hopefully they pack this in two lifts because you know, that's a little whacker machine. I don't know what it is, maybe 3,000 PSI downforce, whatever. That probably is only compacting two or three inches of material. So if you've got six inch screed rails and you run your little whacker over the top of it, you're only compacting the top few inches. That means you're gonna get settling. And whenever you leave something up to mother nature, it always comes back to bite you because mother nature is not even, she's not fair. She doesn't care what your wall looks like. You're in control of that. So make sure you're compacting your base. I always tell my guys, you know, as soon as you feel like that thing's bouncing, run it a couple more times, you know, overdo the compaction. Now this is one step that I don't do, a lot of guys do this, but he's screening off a little bedding layer of sand. So, you know, maybe that's like, a, a, it looks like a dirty sand, you know, it's got some larger aggregate in it. It's not as critical as pavers. You know, pavers, you wanna have really clean bedding sand. If you're gonna use sand on a retaining wall base, you don't want it to be like a mason sand or a really fine sand. You want it to have some variation in size and also be somewhat angular because it's gonna help uh, reduce or eliminate washout underneath your wall base. Personally, I don't use this. I go rock all the way up. I set my blocks with like an 18 pound sledgehammer and by the time I get them set, they're never moving. So I just uh, personally feel better about having the rock come all the way up to the top, but it's a personal option. It does speed things up when it comes to leveling those blocks. All right, and then again, you know, you've seen this picture several times of uh, this guy using a lifter. He's able to kind of straddle the block, really be surgical. That way you don't knock your string line off. That's one thing you have to be super careful about. Again, you, you want to have one of your skilled people doing this, right? A guy that's done it before, if not a guy who's got great attention to detail. Because if one of these block corners deflects and hits this string line, your whole wall is crooked now. If you deflect that string line just a little bit, your whole wall is crooked. So you really got to watch those corners and make sure that you're not deflecting that string line. So he's going to set the block down. That's a dead blow hammer. You know, he's, he's whacking the hell out of those things, trying to get them knocked in nice and level. He's checking each row, checking each block. I check my blocks, you know, three ways. I run the level across the face. I want to make sure that the face of my wall is level. I want to make sure that the back sides of these blocks are level. And then I want to make sure that it's either level or has a slight pitch back front to back. So you're going you're gonna, to, every time you put a block in, you're going to check it three ways, right? Side to side on the front, side to side on the back, and then one time just front to back. Make sure that those blocks are level. I use a sledgehammer and a two by four. You know, we talked about solid unit durability with Versalock, and that's one thing I love. I hardly ever break blocks. I've even hit them bareback where I don't even use a two by four. I'll just slam them with a sledgehammer. I've broke a couple doing that. But for the most part, they stand up really, really well to that kind of abuse. And so I don't like dead blows. I like using a nice heavy 18 pound sledgehammer. You just really get those things hammered in. Step ups. So another thing that I was always confused about when I started building retaining walls is where do I start my wall? Well, what's the answer? It's different on every job site, right? But I'm always thinking about where's my lowest point because I don't ever want to have to get stuck in a spot where I'm stepping down. It's really, really difficult uh, to try to step a retaining wall down into a, a, a swale. You always want to start at your lowest point and build up. Even if you're not at a corner, you know, say the wall dips in the middle, you start in the middle and build out that way then. You know, you want to make sure that whatever you can do to eliminate stepping down, you do that. And there's almost always a way. I've been pigeonholed into it a few times where you just have to, right? But um, <clears throat> again, once you get your base block in, you're going to check these. I use a, uh, and if you talk to your reps, these magnesium screed boards over here are fantastic for this kind of thing. I'll have a guy with an eight foot magnesium screed just snugging it up against the back of the blocks and looking for gaps. Because 
you can't necessarily just run a string line and have one guy hold a string line at one end and the other guy at the other end because again that string line is probably going to deflect. So I'll come through with an eight foot magnesium screed, snug it right up to the back of that manufactured side of the block and just look. I want to make sure and look straight down and make sure there's no little gaps in there. And that's going to make sure that you build a really nice straight wall. Sometimes you get a little bit of concrete slough at the bottom. So you can see this guy's got a little hammer here that he's popping those pins in with. Sometimes you get just a little bit of slough down at the bottom of the block and it'll interfere with the pin. And that's a great way to get around that. You just knock it in with a hammer a little bit. Make sure that as you're setting these blocks, you don't just drop the block right where it goes and pin it. You gotta get that block worked in, right? So you gotta, little back and forth action where you kind of slide it back and forth and score up the bottom and the top and that's going to make sure that you don't get rockers you know where these blocks are starting to kind of tip a little bit because you got a pebble underneath them whatever with the handle it makes it super easy slide it back and forth score it up you know get that thing nice and uh, clean on the base to make sure that you're not going to be building a tippy wall because it's a lot easier to catch it on that course than it is three courses up you know, by the time you've buried that little pebble and you got, you know, two feet built on top of it, you're never going to correct it. You can mask it maybe with shims, but in my opinion, shim shims are for the weak. Just do it the right way uh, to begin with, you know, and some blocks you can't help it, but try to avoid shims. So top-down pin system, it's going to go down into the block below it. There again is our drain tile. He's got a socked, perforated, four-inch drain tile there, um, making sure that he's got some slope on it. I mean, I would definitely go in there and have a guy grab a shovel or a rake and kind of clean up some of that slough back there and just get a nice, even keel on it. Uh, one thing I want to point out is that this guy's probably built a little bit too tall here for my comfort level. I, just, I don't like building walls, you know, more than a foot and a half, maybe two feet without backfilling them. You really got to get backfilling behind the wall because the backfill becomes part of the strength of the wall. So because of the batter on that, if you leave that, that wall unbackfilled overnight and you get two inches of rain, that thing is likely to tip over before you get back in the morning. So make sure that you're backfilling before you leave at night. Little T thing there, that's going to shoot the water out through the face. Hopefully there's a drain grate on the front. You know, to me, again, that's a, just a, an indicator that that doesn't look completely finished. I, I like putting a nice clean grate. Big difference before and after. Again, just one of those details that, that uh, polishes up your project. So use those drain covers. All the uh, retail yards have them. All the contractor yards have them. You just got to order them. Five bucks a piece. Uh, cheap way to just dress things up really nice. This is our drain rock. This picture bothers me a little bit because this to me looks kind of like a river rock. I would never use river rock if I could avoid it. Uh, I realize there's some regions where you just can't get three quarter inch limestone or, or dolomite. Those are probably the best two options and a, a good clean angular backfill. If river rock's all you can get, you have to use it, but it's like having ball bearings behind your wall. Uh, if you have rounded, you know, like pea gravel, guys used to use pea rock all the time. It's like a bunch of little marbles, right? There's no interlock. So when you're using a, a good angular three quarter inch backfill, that stuff locks together. It really uh, binds up really good and gives you a lot of structural integrity. This stuff right here is probably gonna move around a little bit. You know, it's, uh, again, it's just cheap insurance. If you can use three quarter inch limestone or a jagged rock, use that and avoid river rock and pea rock. Main thing is that it doesn't have fines in it. <clears throat> it has to be clean. So we're talking about geogrid. Uh, you know, we've got the, the drain rock behind there. Geogrid's gonna go in. Notice that he's keeping the front side of this geogrid about an inch to, a, you know, three quarter inch, whatever back from the face because don't forget, you're gonna have a three quarter inch batter on these blocks, right? So if you bring this forward to the front of that, you're gonna have a bunch of like black geogrid stuff sticking out the face of your wall. I've seen it happen. Uh, I was on a big commercial job and actually a different contractor was building the wall but he left a bunch of geogrid poking out through the face and he thought it'd be a good idea because he spent, I bet he spent 50 bucks in razor blades. He had a guy running along trying to cut that stuff. This is extremely strong 
uh, material. It's really difficult to cut. And what happens when you run a razor blade up, uh, you know, against concrete? Immediately dull, right? You're boned. So he went and got a torch. He was like, well, razor blade didn't work. Let's burn it. Well, this stuff melts. It doesn't burn off clean. So he was melting this geo grid, and then he's got black stuff, you know, all over the face of the wall. You just could never get it off. I have no idea how he solved that, but I remember looking at it thinking, thank God that's not me. So make sure you keep your geo grid back a little bit. You do not need to get a pin in that. That's there uh, strictly to hold it temporarily. So the pins have nothing to do with the grid. It's the weight of the block that sandwiches that grid in and holds it in place. So you can see here, it's kind of neat because you can build up. Again, whenever you don't have to take your hat off and put a different hat on, you're increasing efficiency and the speed at which you can put these walls in. So they've stacked up, you know, maybe three rows and they've got GeoGrid in there, but they're letting that GeoGrid hang. Now, once he stacks this next row before he backfills, he'll take it like a sheet and wrap it over the top of the block and then he'll introduce his backfill. That way he can compact it and then just flip the geogrid back over it. So it allows you to just keep stacking more quickly, that way you don't have to stop, you know, Joe, go get the compactor, Joe 2.0, go get the bobcat and start, you know, start backfilling and you gotta do all that stuff, right? This way you can just keep stacking the block up, keep pinning and take that hat off less frequently. So geogrid layout, he's gonna pull it kinda tight, it doesn't have to be taut, my dad was in the army, he used to make me bounce a quarter off my bed. It doesn't have to be like that, you know, like you wanna make sure that you pull it back so that it is, uh, it's not, it doesn't have big ripples. You wanna get it as flat as you can possibly get it. So he's gonna lay that grid out and stake it in. Um, you know, you can use a stake, you could potentially even use backfill if you want to pile some backfill on there, but a stake's probably going to keep it in place better. That stake is a burner. It's going to stay there forever. So that stake, spend the rest of its life right there. You just bury it and compact over it. And you can see here, you know, we're at a point now where this is probably the top of the wall. Uh, and the reason I say that looking at this picture is because he's got his virgin soil going all the way to the back, I don't see drain rock in here. So to me, that's an indicator that, you know, they're probably tearing this off. Um, because if, if it wasn't the top, I would wanna see a one foot section of drain rock in there. But if it's the top of the wall, you've got about a foot of impermeable or virgin soil that you're gonna pack in on top of your drain rock because that's gonna, uh, it's gonna minimize or eliminate the possibility for water to run in and sit behind your wall. And of course, you know, water is always the enemy of everything we're trying to build outside. So you want to avoid getting water wash out right behind those blocks. Again, compaction, compaction, compaction. It's like the three L's of real estate, right? It's just don't under compact stuff because it will move abnormally. And once you get abnormal movement, you start to get low spots and high spots and low spots collect water and high spots shed water. And whenever you have uneven moisture distribution, which means you've got, you know, super dense wet soil over here. Over here, it's more dry. When it freezes, it's gonna move differently. You know, water expands by like 9% when it freezes, something like that's why I throw an Aquafina bottle in the freezer, poof, right? It pops the cap off or whatever. Same thing happens in the ground. So if you have uneven distribution of water behind your wall, your whole wall is gonna move differently. So you, you, it's, again, it's, a, it's imperative that you think about drainage and, and uh, make sure that you get your compaction done really thorough. They're using a roller compactor. That roller compactor might compact up to eight to 10 inches in one lift. You know, we talked about the little whacker guy that does two or three. That roller will probably do eight to 10 inches in one lift, but it's a heavy piece of equipment and you do not want that directly behind the back of your wall. You know, two, three feet. I think the spec is three feet. So, and that's true for skid steers too. As you're building your wall, sometimes you get cornered into a position where you have no choice but to drive your skid steer or your dingo or whatever behind that wall as you're building it. You just have to do it. Well, if you have to do it, try to stay three feet back because that's the point where you're gonna start uh, uh, applying enough lateral pressure because of the weight 
to start pushing those blocks out and seat them unevenly. So make sure you're thinking about how much weight you put back behind that wall as you're building it. And again, this is the exact system, uh, system I use. I, I have one guy setting, you know, this, this guy right here, he's probably been with me for a while and he knows exactly how I want those blocks set in. And this guy right here, you know, he's new. He's the guy that uh, buys beer most Fridays and, and he's also the guy that's gonna lift most of the blocks for the guy that knows what he's doing. So uh, work smarter, not harder kind of a deal. But, but that's the system I use. You know, I have a Bobcat come along, I uh, got a pallet of block. Now the only thing I guess I like, I like the efficiency of this picture, but I'd like to see two pallets at least there. And the reason I say that is because Sometimes you do get a little bit of variation. One light gray will be a little bit lighter or darker than another light gray, you know, and, and you don't want to see those lines in your wall and you don't want to see blotches in your wall where it's like a different color a little bit. So you got to be a little bit careful. I usually like to pick off at least two palettes if I can. And then the finishing touch, we're just going to glue those caps on. Um, how many of you guys saw that Domino video? That was pretty sweet, right? Where the guy had all the caps on end, and then he flicks the end one, and they all, ch -ch 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 -ch. you guys see that? I tried to set it up, it didn't work. I don't know how he got it to work, but <clears throat> it's a little bit harder with Versalock uh, capstones because they do have that bevel on it, but if you're using like a two foot runner, maybe it's a possibility. Again, you're gonna you know, possibly chip caps, but it's a pretty cool video. Um, they're just putting a little bead of block adhesive on the front and then on the back, you know, three eighths inch thick, whatever it is. Uh, it's okay to go ahead and glue these caps this way. We'll talk about when you're doing a paver overlay, tomorrow we'll, we'll cover paver overlays a little bit. We'll talk about why you don't want to glue your paver overlay like this, but this is fine for retaining wall caps. So you go ahead and glue your caps down, make sure that you get them as even as you can. Compaction again, compaction, they're building up, they're gonna get that dirt packed in there behind the wall. This is something that a lot of guys don't think about, uh, backfilling the toe slope. Uh, you do not want your base layer of block to be showing. And a lot of times on big commercial walls, you're gonna over excavate, right? So you're gonna dig down maybe two, three feet, maybe five, six feet wide, whatever a bobcat bucket uh, width is that you're using. So you'll come in, you'll make your cut, and then you start building up. And so before you backfill your toe slope, it looks like your base is elevated. You just gotta make sure that you get that toe buried enough so that the front of that wall is not gonna wanna blow out. We use terms like global stability, and that's what that's referring to, is that, <clears throat> well, it's one part of it, is that the base of that retaining wall isn't going to want to kick out because it's going to be retained by, you know, maybe a foot of soil, depending on the height of the wall. As we get into engineering, we'll talk about uh, some of the predetermined specs that do exist for that, as far as if you have a toe slope, if you're building on level ground, if you have a, uh, a load slope. So uh, all those factors are going to are going to kind of change how much embedment you need on the base of your wall. So make sure you're backfilling those toe slopes. Nice big wall there, it's a commercial job. I think this is one here in Minnesota. We probably could have photoshopped the Biff out of it, but how many of you guys are hauling Biffs to your job sites now? Yeah, it's not a bad idea, right? You can actually make some pretty decent money. You charge 250 bucks and, and uh, you know, most of those companies will drop them off for 150 or whatever, but it's a great way to, um, and of course COVID was kind of the genesis of, of probably most of us looking at BIFs. I mean, general contractors use them, but <clears throat> for us it's awesome because we don't have to send Joe, Joe, and Joe to the gas station, right? Because the gas station trip takes an hour and that's three guys, so that's three man hours gone. And I hate having my guys go into my client's home, screw up the floor. Everybody's got a brand new marble bathroom floor or whatever. And I, I you know, I, I just don't like my guys having access to my client's houses, uh, just from a security standpoint. So, uh, but anyways, enough about Biff's. They're a great idea if you get stuck on some larger projects. Talk about design capabilities. Again, you got huge walls here. You know, your base wall there might be 20 feet tall and then you got another one. So you're, you're spanning 40 vertical feet there. Um, I can tell you for sure 
that there is a ton of GeoGrid, especially on this lower tier. Uh, one thing we'll talk about when we get into engineering is that these retaining wall tiers need to be built at a two to one ratio. So if this base wall is 10 feet tall, I want 20 feet between these tiers. Otherwise, I'm building the second tier in the failure plane of the first wall, if that makes sense. Uh, in other words, this second wall is gonna become a load for the first wall, and that lower wall has to be designed to carry that load, which means it needs a bunch of geogrid, and your engineer will tell you how much. But again, nice big project, you know, a, a bike laneway. All right, so we've talked about all this. Design flexibility, being able to do columns, being able to do curves, odd angles, freestanding walls, solid blocks. You know, you can crack them, you can uh, cut angles in them. Just a ton of flexibility with the Versalock line. Make sure that we're compacting, and again, if you don't have a good soils engineer, find a guy. That, that you can go to, uh, you know, maybe two guys that you can go to. Uh, that way you can send them over plans, they'll rubber stamp them. One thing we're gonna do after lunch is run through Versalock's estimating software, and it's a great tool, not only to exemplify how much work GeoGrid does for us, but it's a great estimating tool, and it also, uh, it plants a lot of great seeds for how to approach engineering when it comes to these taller walls because changing just tiny variables, uh, soil content, soil mo moisture content, uh, toe slope, load slope, surcharges, all those, those little details are gonna change how you have to build your wall. Everybody hears the four foot rule, right? At four feet, that's where you need geogrid or a stamp because that's considered a load bearing wall in most municipalities. Well, that's not always true from an engineering standpoint. Four foot tall with Versalock is the maximum capability in perfect scenario, which means you're building in sand. You're building on a level ground. It's not a, you know, there's not a parking lot behind it. All these different things uh, that can contribute to changing that height requirement. So it's not a given that every single wall you go out, if it's over four feet, you for sure need engineering. But even walls that are under four feet a lot of times may need some sort of engineering component because uh, site conditions are gonna be different all the time. And again, as with Versalock, being a solid block, it's 82 pounds. Uh, so at two thirds of a square foot, that means one square foot is gonna weigh like 120 pounds, right? And so that's what the engineer is looking at, is how much the weight of the block is able to hold back, and that's how they're gonna tell you how tall you can build without geogrid or soil reinforcement. It's also why it's so important to core fill blocks that do need core fill, like our square foot block. I believe that's it for the installation part. Um, 